Okay, so I'm going to invite uh, Jess to come and speak to us now. I just need to do a little bit of introduction. I know you've all seen the thing that I put out, but explain to who Jess is and where she comes from. But this is my personal explanation. Because uh, when we made the connection with St. Belitis, it was Russell Winfield who was the development officer that I worked with. And it was fantastic setting everything up with him. And then they made him the dean of St. Belitis, which is great. Um, but I was kind of left going, so what happens to me now? And he introduced me to Jess. And it's been just the greatest joy to work with Jess so far. She's one of those people who never sees problems. <laughs> oh, so far. <laughs> well, she might be going on to great things. She's got a PhD, which is very clever. Um, so it's such a joy to work with Jess because she's one of those people who doesn't see problems. She sees ways through to solutions. And as we approach youth work today, I know that we all, you know, we all know what the problem is when. We uh, our churches turn around to us and say, there are not enough young people in our churches. And they see a problem. And those of us who care, we want to work out how God is connecting with young people, how we can connect with young people. This isn't about a problem, it's about a solution. So I don't for one moment think Jess is going to give you all the, all the answers. But I do think that Jess is one of those people who can help us think through how, why, what it is that we're doing. So I'm going to invite Jess to come and speak to us now, and you can ask all your questions in a minute, uh, but I just do want you to welcome her in the appropriate way. Thank you. Thank you, Ant, for those kind words. Is this, can you all hear me? Yeah. There we go. Hello, good afternoon everyone. It's wonderful to be with you. Um, it's so special to be here. We arrived yesterday um, and it's a real joy to just to have this sort of next half an hour, 40 minutes or so to unpack some ideas and then I'll put forward some questions and then it would be good to hear from you as well, sort of any questions that you have and just any thoughts as well as part of our time together. Um, the title of this lecture um, or something that I've been thinking about is Youth Work and Embedded and Embodied Approach looking at the influence of Pauline anthropology on youth work and discipleship. And my hope is that this lecture will offer some thoughts on what an embedded and embodied approach to youth ministry might look like. Um, this stems from some of my own research um, that I'm doing presently in Pauline anthropology. So as Anne said, I'm doing my PhD at the moment in the area of Pauline anthropology. Um, so this is sort of where these ideas are stemming from and really looking at the person's or a young person's place within our cultural surroundings, where we're based and where we're set. And this has implications for our youth work, our children's work, our adult ministry work, um, as a way of seeing people socially embedded in the context to which they are in. So to begin, what does Pauline anthropology have to say about the youth work space? These are two areas that you might think don't have much in common. Um, but because of my work that I'm doing at the moment, um, I'm doing a PhD in Pauline anthropology. And one of my roles at St. Melitus over the last three years has to be a formation group tutor to a group of youth workers. So I've had the joy of sort of training and working with um, young people who have been training in the field of youth ministry. And youth work has been a part of my life in one way or another for the last 14 years or so. And this has meant that these two sort of trails of thought have overlapped in one way or another to ask this question. How can Pauline anthropology speak to the contemporary youth work space? So in this lecture, I'm going to set forward some ideas that are hopefully to be interpreted, to be discussed, to be reflected upon and applied where appropriate. And I hope this lecture will offer some frameworks for you to think about um, in the overlapping spaces of Pauline anthropology and youth work to be applied in your local context. The writer of um, Psalm 8 says this in verse 4, What is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? 
the overlap of the study of, theolo of theology and anthropology contemplates this question. What is mankind that you are mindful of us? So to offer a roadmap for this lecture, I'm going to be making three key observations. The first is that young people are socially embedded and embodied. The second is that relationality presupposes individuality. And in this, we're going to highlight some of the importances of participation theology and how that's important in both theory and practice. And then young people as the third, young people as interpreters of culture, looking at how culture is a byproduct of worship, so paying special attention to what people worship. I'm going to draw on the work of one scholar um, in particular, whose name is Susan Grove Eastman. Um, her work I engage with a lot in my research. Um, she makes a really sort of helpful contribution to Pauline anthropology in a way of bridging the gap between biblical and contemporary culture. Her work draws on many elements of contemporary psychology and studies in cognition that, in my view, breathe fresh life into the field of biblical studies. And so my hope for this time is that we would also gain a fresh inspiration from the spirit of the living God who is at work amongst us, that we would gain fresh vision for youth work in whatever setting we are in. Shall I pray for us, just as we continue? Father God, we thank you that you are here with us, that by your spirit you are working and moving. And Father, I just pray that as we set aside this time, that you would speak to us, that you would inspire us, that you would give us some fresh thoughts and fresh visions for the ways in which you're wanting to work and move. So pour out your spirit, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh man. So just to set the scene sort of a little bit around the context to which I've been sort of working or ministering um, in for the last sort of decade or so, um, is that I speak from the youth work scene that's based in the UK, particularly in London, which has been my home for the last three decades. Um, and just to paint a picture of sort of what we're seeing there at the moment, um, we're seeing the increasing pressures of the cost of living crisis that is taking place there. Um, the digital space is becoming more and more um, prevalent. We're seeing young people with increased anxiety and mental health issues than ever before. Um, we have a generation that has moved online with a lot of uncertainties, they're, they're feeling surrounding their futures, having lived through a global pandemic and also the threat of the climate crisis being ever increasingly showed to them and told to them. And perhaps m most shockingly, um, this has become the least religious um, generation as well in the church, with lots of young people sort of falling away from church. But we believe or we hope and pray that this is a moment where actually we're going to see the tides turn. And for where people, or young people in particular, have stepped away from church, we're going to see them coming into churches again. So the title of this lecture seeks to find an embedded and embodied approach to youth work. And by definition, the term embedded um, can sound quite structured um, to think that we're sort of quite set in our ways, like a plant being embedded into soil. Um, but with this image, I want to think that actually there is space to grow within that, that even though you may be fixed, I want to argue that this embedded nature refers to um, a transient space where there is space to grow, but space to also learn the settings to which we find ourselves. Because after all, humanity um, transitions through time. We tr move through space. We go on journeys, gaining new perspectives and new insights. And how we take time to learn and reflect on what that is, on what is important, is particularly key for our youth work. So as we look to what being embedded and embodied looks like and how this can be applied, sort of thinking particularly around sort of areas of mission or um, evangelism, things like that, I want to reflect on Acts 17. And if you have a Bible on your phone, do, um, do you have a look at that? But I find this passage really helpful 
in kind of setting the space when it comes to thinking about how we share the gospel or how we reflect on the settings to which we find ourselves. In Acts 17, we see Paul in Athens and the Stoic philosophers and Epicureans are challenging him and they bring him to the um, Aerogopus to get him to explain his teaching. And Paul says this in Acts 17, verses 22 to 23, which has appeared on the screen as well. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Aeropagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant in the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. And then Paul goes on to sort of proclaim the gospel and tell them that the God that they're worshipping to this unknown space, he actually goes on to tell them the good news of Jesus. And this example of apologetics shows that Paul takes the time to get to know a city before he then proclaims the gospel to them. In this case, Paul notices how they were, one, very religious as a place, and two, how they had many items of worship in that space, even one to an unknown God. A people who were prepared to worship anything and everything, something that was even unknown to them. And we see that in culture, every human has the capacity to worship. It all just really depends on what you choose to worship. So as we begin, I hope that this space will offer time for reflection, for us to think together. That we all, as children of God, may contemplate the call of Matthew 28 to make disciples of all nations and to share the good news of Jesus Christ. So to begin, we're going to look at what it means for young people to be socially embedded and embodied. The phrase embedded and embodied, um, which is the title of this lecture, is borrowed from the scholar Susan Eastman. She puts forward some key research in the field of Pauline anthropology in her book, Paul and the Person, Reframing Paul's Anthropology. She offers a functional understanding of the human being as relationally constituted agents who are both embodied and embedded, embedded in their world. This is also a challenge to some of the contemporary, more individualised versions of the self that we might see. For example, the famous um, contention in the Enlightenment that was first put forward by René Descartes, cognito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Some would argue that Paul himself, as we look at a Pauline anthropology, that Paul didn't really have an individual understanding of the self, but only saw the person in relation to Christ and then to others around us. And I think there's room for both in this argument. Um, However, I'm going to show that predominantly Paul's anthropology is relationally constituted, that he does see who we are in relation to those around us. Another key element of Eastman's work, which I think is highly important for any study on Paul and his thinking, is that she maintains the conversation that the conversation around Pauline anthropology should be held considering Christology. So that's in light of the understanding that Jesus was fully God and fully human. Reading Paul in light of his Christological understanding puts Christ at the center of any thinking around the person. Therefore, conversations around Pauline anthropology need to contend first with his view of Christ and the reality of who he was. And this feeds into the relational view as well as with Christ being fully God and fully human, that relationality was actually within him, in himself, that Christ himself was relational. With Eastman's reframing of Paul's anthropology, she introduces some really valuable language regarding the nature of a person as well. That being that they are embedded and embodied is developed to demonstrate how vital it is to understand a person in light of their surroundings, in their light of their upbringing, their neighbourhood, the things that they enjoy, interests, things like that. 
Another scholar who, who Eastman draws on is the work of James Dunn, who also highlights that humans cannot exist in isolation, only in relationship with others and the world around them. With this understanding that human beings are embedded and embodied, Eastman explores the role of humanity's participation in Christ. She writes, to be in Christ is to be in relationship with people and thereby to share experiences not only with Christ, but also with one another. It is to be constituted as interpersonal beings at the foundation of our identity, always to be oneself in another, never in isolation or autonomy. The self is never isolated, but rather connected to those around us. And this is why we see sort of the body of Christ, the church come together, that we're not meant to do things on our own, to be autonomous beings, but to be in relationship with those around us. So to develop slightly what I mean by Paul's theology being relational, um, this stems from a Christological understanding of what it is to be in Christ and to be with Christ. That because God himself is relational in his very nature, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our human, dish, our human condition therefore reflects that in some way, that we too are meant to be relational. The late James Dunn, um, a British New Testament scholar, writes, Paul's anthropology is not a form of individualism. Persons are social beings, defined as persons by their relations. In Paul's perspective, human beings are as they are by virtue of their relationships to God and his world. This context is vital to a proper understanding of Paul's anthropology. This is dealing with much more than whether you're introverted or extroverted and like spending time with people. This is a reflection of God's heart and God's community for us to be set in relationship. This is all stems from the fact that God knows us and that we are known by God. One key scholar who looks at this is um, a scholar called Chris Tilling, who so happens to be my PhD supervisor. Um, and he deals with this topic of relationality. He says, to know God is to worship him. To know God is to be known by him. A two-way relationship of acknowledgement and obligation. God makes the first move. We are known by him. And in knowing him, we are then able to worship him. We see throughout the Bible, particularly in the Hebrew Bible in the Old Testament, that God has a unique relationship with his people, a covenant. He gives um, them a name to call him, which is Yahweh. There's a relational component that stems all through scripture to Jesus. So what does this language of embedded and embodied have to say to the contemporary youth work space? I want to argue for two things. The first is that seeing young people as embedded and embodied means we need to listen to their experiences. An embedded nature speaks to ensure that we listen to young people about their culture, about their experiences, and about their interpretations, allowing for a two-way dialogue of discussion. Learning more from young people and their experiences of culture and the places to which they find themselves is key for beginning to engage in any conversation about what then faith might look like as part of their walk of life. The second is in a world that is becoming increasingly individualized, we need to not give up the call to be the body of Christ. This relational aspect of Paul's theology is what speaks to our individualized experiences and draws us away from ourselves, but into relationship again with Christ and those who are around us. The challenge or the reminder of Hebrews 10, 25, to not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. To see youth work as embedded and embodied means not neglecting to listen to young people to remember that we are relational beings and that this is important for our discipleship. So the second sort of key thing is to look at relationality, how, how relationality presupposes individual, individuality. 
So following on from my previous points on sort of how we can apply some of this stuff about what it means to be embedded and embodied, this is the reminder that re relationality presupposes individual individuality. In her essay, Participation in Christ, Eastman argues that those of us in a post-Enlightenment world have adopted assumptions about the individual as an autonomous self. And she questions whether the individual actually even existed in Paul's day, as I mentioned. However, she goes on to argue that no one could accuse Paul of lacking a robust sense of himself, whether or not he had a theory of the self or not. She explores, explores this within the concept of the second person hermeneutic, which is basically looking at the plural language that Paul uses in his writings. We are all products of our environment, that she argues, and we all have influence on one another, whether we realise it or not. In an article she writes called Known and Being Known, she puts forward the following. She says that in Paul's view, knowledge of God is socially embedded and thereby involves the same capacities for personal knowledge as knowing other human beings as distinct from ourselves and yet in relationship with us. Specifically, she says, I shall claim that God's self-revelation engages interpersonally constituted human cognitive capacities that take place in the midst of human interaction. She argues that the experience of being known precedes and grounds the capacity to know another. I'll say that again. She argues that the experience of being known precedes and grounds the capacity to know another. There's something important in us understanding the fact that we are known by God before we are then able even to comprehend how we can know another. If we have the knowledge or awareness of another, we have the capacity to learn and interact with them. And she explores this within the context of childhood development and imitation. And she uses um, a study that was done on young infants and babies with imitation. That before a baby understands their sense of self or have an awareness of what they look like, if you think of a sort of six-week-old baby thereabouts, if you smile at that child they are able to mimic a smile back to you. Their muscles move in their face and they sort of smile back as you smile at them. But they have no knowledge of what their face looks like yet or how they can move those muscles. Eastman uses this study to argue that a child is not passive, but neither are they autonomous or self-referential. We are bound up in relations to one another. And we see this in Paul's theology of the church in 1 Corinthians 12. We are the body of Christ. We are not meant to do things in isolation. And there isn't enough time to get into this now, but as I've looked at, or as I've sort of previously mentioned, the, the first and second plural in Paul, um, he jumps between quite a lot. And it's to show, or I think to show, that Paul really cares about the nature of who we are in relation to one another that although he is aware of the self and sort of who we are as individuals, he is really interested in, in sort of our interactions and how we care for the other. In 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, we see this demonstrated, as I mentioned, we have 1 Corinthians 12 where we see the body of Christ, that we are all different members but part of one body. And then in 1 Corinthians 13, we have the famous love passages that is often read at weddings. The outworkings of what it means to be in the body of Christ. At the end of 1 Corinthians um, 13, verse 12, we have this beautiful verse. It says, for now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Returning to that quote by Eastman where she says, the experience of being known precedes and grounds the capacity to know another. It's because we are fully known by God that we have the capacity to love and to know another. 
And this sense of being known by God is the beginning of our understanding of what it is to be creatures, but also us in relation to God. That God, in his love, reaches out first to us. We are relationally constituted beings. This is why having a theology of participation is important in both theory and practice. And Willie James Jennings, in his commentary on Acts, says, Ministry in the name of Jesus Christ releases people to speak. A ministry that encourages people to speak also needs to be one that listens to those who are speaking. The ministry of conversation and listening is something that I think we can often lose sight of. Listening to someone takes patience and it takes attention. This is the same for a conversation. The digital world we live in is fast-paced. I know this to be true of London. And it means that when information comes your way, you can be bombarded with notifications, endless updates, and a lot of conversations you're trying to ignore. Time is limited and people are in a rush. Listening and having a conversation takes time. It's the task of a relationship, one that we need to be willing to enter into. It's no wonder that at the start of the famous love passage in 2 Corinthians 13, Paul begins with the phrase, love is patient. Love takes time. We need to be willing to have those conversations to be interrupted, to listen and to speak. Being relational is the foundation of discipleship. Discipleship is also something that takes time. Samuel Wells, a priest and theologian, writes, discipleship is being with God as shaped by being with oneself, but also one's community of faith, one's close relationships, and the wider creation. Discipleship recognizes the individual and leads them into a community of fellowship in the body of Christ, a personal relationship with Christ, and also the public church. And it can be easy when we say these things or when we think of topics such as discipleship, we think of that in the context of adult ministry for those over the age of 18. But actually, for those 18 and under, this sort of call to discipleship from an early age is still one that we can enter into. The final point I want to make is that seeing young people as embedded and embodied and as relationally constituted means that we can also view them as the interpreters of culture. The purpose of this section is to reflect on our cultural embeddedness, particularly our work with young people. And I'm indebted to one of my colleagues, Mark Scanlon, for many conversations on this topic and his research in this area. Andrew Root is a youth ministry thinker in the United States, and he explores the idea that young people and youth cultures are about this idea of making and meaning, exploring what identity is within cultural structures that impact us all. We view culture through structures that form and shape culture. He draws on the work of Raymond Williams, who sees culture as a way of life or the structure within the day. Root writes, as youth workers and also church leaders, we should honor the cultural constructions of young people, for they are the genius of meaning making. They have existential depth. Young people are good people to be thinking on this topic and asking questions to because they are experts in expressing identity. I don't know if you ever had to wear a school uniform when you went to school, um, but you quite often see in youth work settings that young people will never wear their school uniform in the same way as someone else. I remember we all had a set uniform, but people would find different ways to pin things to their uniform, or you'd find a different way to do your tie to someone else. You'd add a jacket, or your hair would be slightly different. And no matter how structured the school tried to make a uniform setting, um, Young people, or my peers at the time, would always find a way to express a sense of individuality. Young people are good people to be thinking on this because they are so good at expressing themselves. 
We need to not ignore the contributions of young people. Because if we do, we're going to become passive in the way that we engage with culture. Root writes, for youth ministry, youth culture itself is the invitation to dialogue. It becomes a hermeneutical reality where meaning and identity are being constructed. And because it is about meaning and identity, it is bound in culture, but rests in deep questions of existence itself. This is how culture leads into the theological. It happens by first honouring those culturally called adolescents, assuming their practices and acts to hold meaning. Then it invites them to articulate such meaning for the purpose of theological reflection by asking who and where this God is in the midst of actions and practices done towards or against the cultural structures themselves. This is how youth ministry is theological and how theology is contextual. And it is all this because it's first ministerial. It seeks to embrace the humanity of young people, sharing their lives as a way together to share the life of God. It could be argued that culture is merely a byproduct of worship, What people worship is what forms and shapes us. The stories and things you surround yourself with every day will ultimately add up to the life that you are going to live. Annie Dillard, an American author, says, how we spend our days is, of course, how we spend our lives. So I want to suggest two areas we can reflect upon as we are to offer an embedded and embodied approach to youth work. This approach could be applicable to to secular youth ministry too, in the ways that we want to see the negatives of individualism eradicated and the vision that every young person has value and something to bring, whether Christian or not. However, the contributions of Pauline anthropology sees the starting place for any engagement with people, whether young people or older people, being the person of Christ. This places value as being known by God, their creator. Two areas that bring us closer to him that I would like to suggest are important. The first is reading scripture with young people, and the second is embracing the traditions of prayer. So the first, reading scripture with young people. This may be an obvious one, something that is given in our Christian practices and upbringing, the importance of scripture. However, reading scripture with young people invites them to add their thoughts, their constructions, and their ideas, to encourage them to share their own interpretations and reflect on what the Spirit might be speaking to them about. And I don't want you to mishear me. As someone who is particularly interested in biblical studies, I see good exegesis as being of the utmost importance when it comes to teaching the ways of scripture and unpacking what it really means. But we need space to learn and understand the text as best we can. It's a communal exercise, something that should be done together. There's something so beautiful about seeing young people engage with the task of hermeneutics themselves. This quote circulates around education. It says, children must be taught how to think, not what to think. This task of enabling people to, on how to think but not what to think needs to be brought into how we read scripture together, how to unpack ideas, how to reflect together. The second is embracing the traditions of prayer. The second thing to consider is to embrace the traditions of prayer. I'm not someone who particularly likes silence Um, I'm always someone to have something on in the background, um, but within the tradition of prayer within the Christian church, I think there's something so beautiful about creating space for silence. Julian of Norwich said, the whole reason why we pray is to be united into the vision and contemplation of God to whom we pray. The task of prayer is to be united with God and to contemplate him. It's by embracing different traditions, whether silent, communal, lament, reflective, or practicing the examen, whatever it is, that creating space and variety for young people within this tradition 
enables young people to step away and fix their eyes on Jesus. In an age where we are being told that the self is the most important thing and needs to be worshipped, this is a time where we can take our eyes away from that and fix them afresh on to Jesus. So to conclude, to see youth work as embedded and embodied means not neglecting listening to young people and remembering we are relational beings. Allowing young people to be interpreters of culture and taking time to hear their experience. This can help us in paving a way forward in youth work. For all humanity, our embedded and embodied nature first finds its home in the person of Christ. As St. Augustine famously wrote in the Confessions, he says, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. We are all journeying to be reunited with Christ. Our relational nature is from him and will return to him. We are known by an ever-loving father who calls us back to himself, reflecting on an embedded and embodied approach to youth ministry I hope, will give space to reflect on Christ and his heart for this next generation. So with that in mind, I have some questions for you all to think about. Um, I'm not sure how we're doing from time. Oh, we're okay. Um, I'd love for you to discuss um, for the next five minutes or so, and then maybe we'll do some Q&A. Um, these three questions, um, you can turn to the person next to you. When do you think... When you think about culture, what theological themes do you see? And how do those connect with forms, ideas, and practices of ministry? And then what does it, or could it look like in your context to be embedded and embodied? And then th thirdly, what areas of culture do you see young people speaking into? So turn to the person next to you, discuss some of those things, any things that came to mind and then we'll have a bit of time for Q&A. Does that sound good? Amazing. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the Lord always gives us the answers when we're doing stuff like this, and they're right in front of our faces. Um, I'm going to remind us, I, I, I often tell people this, when I went to primary school, I had recess at 10.30, I had recess after lunch, and I had another recess at 2.30 before I went home. I played all day. <laughs> Today, kids go into school at 8.30, they get a little break after lunch, and it's like there's no social life. So I think the, the, the thing that kids are starving for is just being. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to convict myself how many of us went to a Sunday school picnic before we went to church? So we got to get the Sunday school picnic back. And I'm, you know, I know what my church is going to say. Nobody's going to come just us. <laughs> but if you do it for four years, you'll pick up some stray kids who just want to swim. And, you know, I joined the youth choir because the girls first. I got the <laughs> so, you know, we got we to do the... They're there. They're the other thing is we often think about reaching the, the, the edgy kids, like the kids that, like, like what you were saying about, what do we do to get the gang kids? I'm not going after the gang kids. I'm going after kids that are already outside the door. And then she's the cousin of the gang guy. Yeah. And I get her life transformed. She'll go get the gang guy to come, and he'll come on his own. So I think the way we deal with the culture, like people often ask, what are you doing to reach the, the, the edgy? I'm not doing anything to reach them because there's like hundreds of kids that are good kids right outside the door. If we reach them, then they'll reach the gang kids. Um, so I, I think um, we've got the answers. Um, we need to bring our Sunday school picnics back. We need to eat more with our kids. Um, the Caribbean churches and, and the other islands, they give their kids food every time. Now, I don't know that we can afford to do that. <laughs> You'll get kids if you give them food. So, so I, I heard some amazing things. And the reason why I'm here today is this thing's changing so fast, there's nobody who's got a corner on it, I can tell you right now. Um, 
just trying to keep up with the, the rapid change in our kids. Um, you know, we still do things like tell kids, now remember 9-11, and none of them were alive. So they can't remember 9-11. So. <laughs> so yeah, I think this is excellent for us, and I think the answers are pretty close to us. And thank you for opening our eyes to some of the things that kids are looking for. I want to say amen to everything you just said. Thank you, Jess, very much for being with us this evening. Thank you to all of you, uh, hugely. I want to say something from my experience before I ask Jess to pray for us, um, which is that the questions that we've all been asking tonight, I, I, I not only suspect that they're not new, I know that they're not new. Because um, back in 1990, something or other, um, uh, Gary was talking about the Eden Project, is what you were talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I get a phone call from Andy Hawthorne. Will you come and do some training for us? They've got all these young people embedded in Manchester on the housing estates, and they haven't got a clue how to connect with the young people. How do I talk to them about Jesus? What sort of activities should we be doing? Is sport the right way to go? How do we bring in a Bible study? These are the same questions that we've been facing here tonight. Now, I'm sorry, Ruth and I didn't have any of the answers for them. We just chatted with them and, and, and heard their stories and encouraged them to form relationships with the young folk, to eat with them, to play sport with them, to do all the things that Jess has been suggesting tonight. I think it's the same thing that it's always been. Mark is absolutely right. The answer is in front of us. It's always been in front of us. Jess, today you've helped us to see that it's in front of us, helped us to understand it a bit more, and hopefully that will lead to us doing it a bit more. But would you please pray for us? Because like all churches, we do struggle here in Bermuda with, uh, with the numbers of young people in our churches, um, because when you've got one here and two there and three there, it's very difficult to get them together to form that embedded community. And like all churches, we struggle to know how to be ourselves with them as they need us to be. So thank you so much for being here tonight, and I'm sure everyone will want to uh, show their appreciation to you. But would you also please pray for us first? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that your heart um, is far-reaching, and that your heart for young people overflows and God we just pray now that by your spirit that you would um, pour yourself out upon us now for the things that have um, sparked our, our minds tonight God that you would um, just fan into flame the work um, that your church is doing Father for those things that are right in front of us for these new ideas that are perhaps just embers at the moment Father would you fan them We pray for the conversations um, with children and young people. We pray for good conversations and opportunities for those conversations to share you and all your goodness. Father, pour your spirit out, I pray. Would you fill each one here? Would you refresh them? don't know anything about cellulitis and you want to know more, um, you can grab Jess before she goes, so you can come and talk to me anytime. If you have no idea what the Theological Institute um, is when we talked about it, uh, please come and talk to me. We are not just Anglicans, we're here for all Christians that want to grow in Christ. That's, that's all. Okay, and so we can run a range of different programs to try and meet you where you're at, um, all the way from just want to meet with other Christians and talk about Jesus through to my church leader who said that they want to make me a pastor or a, or a priest. Okay? And we'll, we'll meet you wherever you are. Um, I want to thank you because this, this afternoon wouldn't have been what it is without you and your engagement. 
you uh, are the ones that made Jess's words into something that we can all chew and get over and get on with because you've engaged. And I, above all, want to acknowledge that if you have encountered something here tonight that sparked you, it is because of the presence of God. It is the presence of God that makes a difference. It is our following of Christ uh, that is the most important thing. And it is the way that we are being shaped into that personhood. Ourselves as individuals within an embedded and embodied setting. But after the person of Jesus Christ. So thank you very much for being here this afternoon. I appreciate it.